Thanks for joining me for our reading through the Bible. We're following a chronology um, or a chronological reading that tries to put all of the books and the readings in the order in which they likely occurred. And um, I hope that you're enjoying it thus far. Notice that the readings will be longer every day. And so, as I've said, probably the last two readings, and I'll probably say for the next two or three, that um, I'll occasionally eliminate part of the reading if it's uh, redundant or if it's um, part of a genealogy that I would encourage you to read on your own, of course, but for lack of time or try to keep the videos relatively shorter as we move through the readings, um, just doing that occasionally. So I just wanted to let you know that when that happens, I'll observe skipping to, etc. So today we start in Genesis chapter 8, and we're reading from the Christian Standard Bible. So God remembered Noah, as well as all the wildlife and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water began to subside. The sources of the watery depths and the floodgates of the sky were closed, and the rain from the sky stopped. The water steadily receded from the earth, and by the end of 150 days, the water had decreased significantly. The ark came to rest in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. The water continued to recede until the tenth month and the tenth day, and on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were visible. After forty days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made, and he sent out a raven. It went back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see whether the water on the earth's surface had gone down. But the dove found no resting place for its foot. So it returned to him in the ark because water covered the surface of the whole earth. He reached out and brought it into the ark to himself. So Noah waited seven more days and sent out the dove from the ark again. When the dove came to him at evening, there was a plucked olive leaf in its beak. So Noah knew that the water on the earth's surface had gone down. After he had waited another seven days, he sent out the dove, but it did not return to him again. In the six hundred first year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water that had covered the earth was dried up. So Noah removed the ark's cover and saw that the surface of the ground was drying. And by the 27th day of the second month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, Come out of the ark, you, your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives with you. Bring out all the living creatures that are with you, birds, livestock, those that crawl on the earth, and they will spread over the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah, along with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives came out. All the animals, all the creatures that crawl, and all the flying creatures, everything that moves on the earth, came out of the ark by their families. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He took some of every kind of clean animal and every kind of clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. When the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, he said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of human beings, even though the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth onward. And I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night will not cease. Chapter 9 God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. They are placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it, and I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed, for God made humans in his image. But you, be fruitful and multiply, spread out over the earth and multiply on it. Then God said to Noah and his sons with him, 
Understand that I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, birds, livestock, and all wildlife of the earth that are with you, all the animals of the earth that came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again will every creature be wiped out by floodwaters. There will never again be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant. I am making between me and you and every living creature with you a covenant for all future generations. I have placed my bow in the clouds and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I form clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all the living creatures. Water will never again become a flood to destroy every creature. The bow will be in the clouds and I will look at it and remember the permanent covenant between God and all the living creatures on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and every creature on earth. Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's sons, and from them the whole earth was populated. Noah, as a man of soil, began by planting a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak and placed it over both their shoulders, and walking backward, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. And let God extend Japheth, and Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be Shem's slave. Now Noah lived 350 years after the flood, and so Noah's life lasted 950 years, and then he died. And these are the family records of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They also had sons after the flood. And Japheth's sons are listed all the way through until verse 6. And then Ham's sons are listed until we get to verse um, 15. And then Canaan fathered Sidon. Notice verse 19. The Canaanite border went from Sidon going toward Gerar as far as Geza and going toward Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the Ham's sons by their clans according to their languages in their lands and their nations. And Shem, Japheth's older brother, also had sons. And Shem was the father of, and his listing is all the way through until we come to verse 32. These are the clans of Noah's sons according to their family records in their nations. The nations on earth spread out from these after the flood. The whole earth, chapter 11. The whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make oven-fired bricks. They used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the humans were building. And the Lord said, If they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore it is called Babylon. For there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. And these are the family records of Shem. Shem lived 100 years and fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. The remaining of his lineage concludes when we get down to verse 27. These are the family records of Terah. 
Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans during his father Terah's lifetime. Abram and Nahor took wives. Abraham's wife was named Abram's wife was named Sarah, and Nahor's wife was named Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Sarah was unable to conceive, and she did not have a child. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they set out together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there, and Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. The transitions from chapter 8 to chapter 11 are pretty, pretty substantial. We move from the conclusion of the flood to the introduction to the main character of Abraham throughout the rest of the book of Genesis because it will show the development of Abraham's family, the Israelites particularly. And yeah, of course, in that transition is the Tower of Babel. What's so significant, I suspect, for us is the amount of things that aren't said because we live in such an information-dense society where we know everything, it seems like, about everything. But in the narrative that Moses writes to bring Israel to the place where they are, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis, traces their identity to Adam. And that's its fun function. That's its purpose in the first 11 chapters, to show that they were brought to the world for a purpose. And that purpose is connected with what happened with Adam and Eve, the presence of sin, and what happened at Babylon, the presence of the divisiveness caused by human arrogance that God separated the world through creating different languages. And so that presence, the, the presence of that narrative must not be missed on the overall theme of Genesis, that what Moses is introducing to us will be what the gospel will answer when Jesus finally comes. And of course, with that is Genesis's promise that we're about to hear in the next reading in Genesis. Um, which will occur in a few more days, um, how Jesus will come and be the seed of Abram that will bless all the earth. Thanks for joining me and join me again for another reading tomorrow. And we'll read through the New Testament in chronological order. Have a good day.